We are living in the greatest period in human history. A period of massive technological and economic advancement. Never in our history have we been so close to a world where we can live truly free and independent lives. But here's the thing. There are those with money, power, and influence who would rather see you dependent on them and the system they created. A system designed to keep you comfortable, apathetic, and distracted. We believe the road to true independence doesn't come through political elections or senseless regulation, but rather in maximizing the empowerment of the individual. If you feel the same way, then get ready. My name's Jason Stapleton. Welcome to Wealth, Power, and Influence. Well, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another week. I don't know. I hope you guys had a good weekend. I had, uh, I kind of laid around and didn't do much. I was pretty lazy on Saturday, but Sunday we did, uh, we had some fun. I drove up, Nancy and I took the dog. We were like, let's go get out of the house. We're, we haven't been up to Malibu and some friends of ours said, Hey, we'd like, we, we're thinking about having a, like an evening dinner at Gladstones and watching the sunset. So, um, if you guys, I'll kind of give you guys, a lot of people don't, aren't familiar with California or Los Angeles or Malibu and all that stuff. And it's, it, first of all, Malibu is not a bougie place to go. You, you, you think that, oh, that's where all the celebrities are. And that's where, oh, you go, oh, Malibu is where they all hang out. No, Malibu is really just a string of homes, most of which are way up in the hills. And there are a few places where you might see a celebrity, but it's not as likely as you would think. And so we go up there when I go to Malibu, it's because I want to get away from stuff. Like I, I don't want to get out of the city, which is why a lot of people live in Malibu because they don't want, they need to be close to Los Angeles, but they don't want to be in it. And uh, Malibu is very expensive, and it also also there are no paparazzi allowed in Malibu. So you, if you have if you have some celebrity and you're trying to go up there, you don't have to worry about people taking your picture. Well, you got you got to worry about normal people taking your picture, but not actual paparazzi. And so uh, we went up there, and I thought, well, if we're gonna go to Gladstones, Gladstones is kind of on the south side of Malibu. It's this beautiful uh, seafood restaurant that is literally right on the beach. And they don't take call, they don't, don't take call aheads. They don't take reservations. You just got to show up. I said, well, if we're going to do that, let's roll out maybe around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Let's drive up to Malibu. We'll go to the dog beach. We'll let the dogs run around. And then we'll go down to, to the restaurant. So that's what we did. And they had us, apparently PCH, which is the main highway that runs in and out of Malibu. That's another thing. The only way to get in and out of Malibu really is to go up or down PCH. And it said that was jammed up. So we took the 405 up instead, and we kind of weaved our way through the mountains, which in the beginning I thought was going to be terrible because it added like a half an hour to our trip. But it actually ended up being pretty cool. So we ended up weaving our way down there, and it turns out the beaches were so packed full of people. For all, all for all, all the talk about Southern California, people screaming at each other to wear masks and all the stuff that they're freak out about all the time around L.A., you go to the beaches and it was wall to wall people in Malibu, not a single person wearing a mask, everybody out having a good time. And uh, we couldn't find a place to park. So we actually had to drive down from the dog beach and just walk along the, the, it, Malibu has kind of a, like a promenade that you can walk down that's not on the beach. And so since the dogs aren't allowed on most of the Malibu beaches, we just walked her down the strip for a little while and kind of hung out. And a couple of things, like I don't know if you guys get depressed at all when you're forced to sit inside and we realize that this 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 lockdown has now gone, what is it, six months now, Matt? We're about basically six months of lockdown. It is, it's a crazy if it starts to wear on you, no matter who you are. And it was I, what I, I realized about halfway through the mountain drive. I said, you know what, dude, it just feels good to get out and go for a drive as ridiculous as that sounds in the, in the Los Angeles traffic and, and winding your way through the Hills for an hour and a half. But it's just like, dude, this feels normal. Walking on the beach felt normal. It felt nice. And I am, 
I am so ready for us to get back to that. And I don't think we're going to until, like I said, mid to late September. And that's when you'll start to see some of the restrictions lift. That's when you'll start seeing a more accurate reporting on what the numbers are. It's when you'll see the shift in all of the talk from the media. And it, it, they start, they'll start asking different questions. Like, how long is it reasonable for us to do this? You know, right now, it's completely unacceptable. Fauci's saying, wear, a, wear a goggles and a mask everywhere you go, right? So at this point, all of the media is focused on coronavirus, how dangerous it is, how the death tolls are rising, how it's getting worse. And what you're going to see about September, October is they'll start shifting their narrative. And it will be something closer to, we can't do this forever. It's time to get on a lockdown. When you look at the numbers, they're improving and it's really not that bad. And they'll start asking all these different questions that are the questions that you're hearing us ask on this show right now. And then we're going to have the, the real pandemic. Um, then the real pandemic will start. It, it will be a financial pandemic. Uh, it will be a, a deep recession or depression. And so I'm going to attempt to do something today that is always more difficult because of we have different education levels and different understanding of of how the economy works and how a Federal Reserve works and how our government works. And so I'm going to do my best to kind of explain to you what has happened over the last six months, what the Federal Reserve is now looking to do in order to prevent the next crisis from happening because they know it's coming. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the investment opportunities and things that uh, that really don't exist anymore and, and why that's been such a big problem. And I, while I will not make recommendation to you on where to put your money, I do want to show you a couple of things. And I, I, I thought we'd take a look at some charts. Um, first of all, I think I, you guys knew for a very long time that I was a I was very much a uh, Bitcoin bear. I, I thought when we, especially when we were making that run up into 20,000, I said, this is not good that we are going to see a massive decline. A lot of you, a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money who are out there telling everybody they should be investing in Bitcoin. And yes, I was right. Uh, if you invested four or five years ago, you were fine. But if you invested in that run up when it started to break 10,000 and then 12 and then 15 and everybody was piling on, I said, you are going to lose your shirt. And most of them did. Okay, we're at a place now where Bitcoin has just broken a major resistance level at around 10,300 uh, is kind of that point. You can see uh, if you're if you're listening to the show, you're not going to see this. But for all of you viewing the show in real time or watching it on YouTube, you can see here this this line that my um, that my cursor is on and how, how the res the market had come up and tested once, twice, three times four times, five times, six times in this area between 10,000 and 10,300. And then it had fallen back every single time. And this last week, we broke out of that high. And we actually just yesterday kind of came in and retested that level. We may see a dip back down into around 10,002, um, all the way down maybe to 9,005. Uh, not to throw too many numbers at you, but we could see a, a pullback here. But I think there we are highly likely to see a retest of the 13,000 to 14,000 level. That'll be the next test. And so I think we've got a little bit of up room. If you take a look at Bitcoin over the last, let's say over the last year, if we look at the last 12 months, Bitcoin is only up about two and a half percent from its highs of a year ago today. But if we look at the last month, Bitcoin has climbed 24, almost 25 percent in the last month. It's had a massive run and it would only look to build steam. If we look over at gold and I pull up the gold futures contract, mm, there it is. Uh, oh, sorry, that's light, sweet, crude. Uh, it's GL1, I believe. Uh, da, da, da. Let me see if I've just got the gold spot here somewhere. Uh, there we go. Gold spot trading at 19000 almost uh, 1900 almost $2,000 a coin. I believe that that is an all-time high for gold, and it looks like it is. It looks like the previous print was 2011, August 29th. That was uh, the week of the 29th. That would have been a high of around $1,900, 
1915, something like that for a coin. And we are significantly above that now. And the question that a lot of people have is, well, why is gold surging now? Is it fear? Is it panic? What is it? I don't have any idea. I, I, anybody who tells you they know is it really is, is showing their cards because they truly don't. No one can truly understand the rationale and buying decisions of a multitude of people. Um, what you can infer from that is that people are worried about uh, about their wealth, not necessarily about dollar, because this is where people who are who who believe that the destruction of the dollar is coming, and they always they trot these guys get trotted out every single time, and their voices get really loud when gold surges and when there's lots of money printing, and they say this is going to be the destruction of the dollar. It's the end of the world currency. The dollar is done. You know, they 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 keep saying that, and they point to this as evidence that that's what's going to happen, that people are afraid of the value of the dollar going down, and so they are investing in gold. Um, that's not necessarily true. It may be one concern. A, a bigger concern may be, as we've discussed on this show before, wealth is really a very, a very poor wealth creator. And what I mean by that is if you are investing in gold um, with the expectation that over time you're going to get a significantly large return on that investment, historically, you would be woefully wrong. Gold tends to be a very good wealth protector. So if, for example, uh, the easiest way to, uh, to explain this is if you, if you wanted to buy a suit in, in the 1920s, it would cost you about an ounce of gold. That that was right about what it was. Like a suit was, I don't remember what it was, twenty dollars or something like that. Like a nice suit would cost you. Uh, a nice suit today, a really nice suit today, about an ounce of gold. Okay, maybe a little bit outside of that now at nineteen hundred bucks, but certainly a thousand to two thousand dollars for a really nice suit is kind of the going rate. Unless you get an Indochino suit, and then of course you're going to pay significantly less and look great at the same time www.indochino.com forward slash stapler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but my point is this, is that gold is not, gold is something that you, that you move into if you have a real fear that your investments may lose a lot of value and you're looking for stability and protection of what you've got, not because you're looking to grow what you have, Okay. Um, and like I said, a lot of different reasons for people to get involved in gold. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't gold people out there who buy, uh, who buy gold because they expect it to go up in value. But those are speculators. Those are not investors. Okay. So understanding this, what are some of the other reasons that people might be investing in gold or, or buying gold rather than say stocks or bonds or anything like that? Well, one of the reasons, well, first of all, let's look at two different ways to buy gold. We can actually buy physical gold but that they ship to us, like gold coins and silver and all that stuff. Um, but we also, the, the bulk of the gold is bought on the paper market, meaning they don't actually buy gold. They buy a gold stock. They buy shares of a gold stock or an ETF, which then goes and invests in the gold. So they're not actually, the people who buy paper gold aren't really concerned with the destruction of the world, the end of the dollar as we know it, because they're buying paper, okay? What they're, what they're buying is protection against something. It might be protection against inflation. It might be protection against a declining market. Uh, it might be the fact that they don't really know what's going to happen, and they're they're kind of deer in they're kind of a deer in the headlights. We've talked about this before. They're confused. They don't know what the Fed is going to do next, which the Fed has been the main driver of economic of perceived economic growth and stock market growth in this country. And without the answers to those questions, what's the one place they can go where they are almost certain to protect their money? And that, of course, is gold. And now some alternative currencies like Bitcoin all, should also do well in the face of that. I, I've always been of the opinion that that the the uh, the idea, the concept of gold as an investment and Bitcoin as an investment are, are largely the same at this point. It's very, high, very hard to transact in gold right now, very hard to transact in Bitcoin. The nice thing about Bitcoin is that I can buy Bitcoin directly from, say, a, a, a particular bank, like an online bank. 
and I can transfer money from that online bank into Bitcoin and then move it back out as I want to use it. And so it's easier to transact with Bitcoin right now than it is gold. And if some of the things that we're going to talk about today end up coming to fruition, it may become as regular as using a, a, a debit card or a credit card, uh, which is exciting in, on the one hand. But on the other hand, it, it, causes, some, it causes some other significant problems that, that we haven't quite figured out how we're going to work out yet. So that's kind of the groundwork I thought it would be nice to start the show on today, is kind of evaluating um, what's happening in our economy, why are people nervous, why do we see gold and Bitcoin rising, and what can we expect moving forward, okay? Um, and at this point, if I was teaching a class on this, I would ask if there were any questions. And you don't have the ability to ask questions, uh, at least not unless you super chat. But Matt's going to keep a close eye on the super chat and let me know if there's anything in there that we want to pay attention to. But Matt, do you have anything you want to add to that before we move on? No, most of this conversation is fairly far above my head. Okay. So I'm just sitting here learning too. Okay, cool. So let's start off by taking a look at what the Fed is proposing for the next financial catastrophe. And I'm going to read a little bit from the Zero Hedge article that I'm pulling from. Uh, and this was actually, this is a Tyler Durden article. It's not a, uh, one of the, uh, Zero Hedge takes a lot of articles from other places and other websites and, and repurposes them on, on their site. So I'll read a little bit here and then we'll, we'll talk. Um, over the past decade, one of the most common themes, despite the political upheaval and growing social and geopolitical instability, was that the market would keep marching higher and higher and the Fed would continue injecting liquidity into the system. When they say liquidity, it's important we understand these financial terms that maybe everybody doesn't understand. Liquidity is money. They're pumping money into the, into the, into the system. So if stocks go down and the, gov and the Federal Reserve adds liquidity, what they're really doing is they're putting money into the, into the stock market. How do they do that? A lot of different ways. They might buy stock outright. They might buy bonds for corporations. Um, they might buy ETFs and, or, or on a broad scale in order to kind of lift the market a little bit. This is something that China has done absolutely for decades. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a very, very unhealthy long-term decision to make, but it does provide short-term stability. So they're going to, the second common theme that despite sparking unprecedented asset price inflation, price, uh, price as measured across the board, broad economy, uh, would remain subdued. The, da, 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 da. as a reminder, okay, keep reading here. The Fed's failure to reach its inflation target has sparked broad criticism from the economic establishment, even though, as we showed in June, deflation is now a direct function of the Fed's unconventional monetary policies. So here's what's happened over the last probably 20 years, is that if you measured um, liquidity injections where the Fed stepped in and, and added a, a, bought assets or added money between 1980 and 2000, what you saw is as yields went down, okay, so as interest rates went down, you saw spending go, uh, you saw spending go down. I'm sorry, you saw spending go up, excuse me. Let me reiterate. I got the, I'm looking at the chart and I'm looking at it the wrong way. When you saw yields go down, when interest rates dropped, spending went up. Now, this makes a lot of logical sense, doesn't it? Because if you get less of a return when you invest your money or you save your money in the bank, what does that incentivize you to do? It should incentivize you to spend. And the Federal Reserve would use this tactic when it wanted to facilitate inflation, when it wanted to get consumption going again. What it would do is it would cut its rates. That would People would say, well, I'm not getting much money in the savings account, so what I'll do is I'll go out and buy something. And you know, we, they, they end up spending their money instead. And the reverse of that would be when interest rates went up, people tended to save. They didn't, um, they didn't companies didn't expand because interest rates were higher and it took a while kind of for that to normalize. And so Fed played this game um, for, you know, since about nine, well, they've been doing it for a long time, but this, this graph measures from 1980 to 2000. From 2001 to 2020, as yields went down, spending went down. Now, why, why do you think that would be? Can anybody venture a guess as to why in this day, it's different than in other days. 
why over the last 20 years has it been so difficult for the Fed to facilitate inflation and consumption spending? Well, primarily because nobody's got any money. So no one has any savings. Very few people have investable assets. And because of that, the Fed can continue to cut rates all it wants to. The only people who are actually going to make any money are people who are invested in the stock market. You're not seeing that happen anymore. Okay. Uh, having recently accepted that the preferred stimulus pathway has failed to boost the broader economy, the blame has fallen on how monetary policy is intermit, uh, is in. Inter intermediated, specifically the way that the Fed creates excess reserves, which end up at commercial banks instead of trickling down all the way to the consumer level. So again, I know this is hard. Please follow me with this. I'm going to do my best to make it make sense to you. So traditionally, if we wanted to stimulate the economy, the Federal Reserve would reduce interest rates. How does it do that? Well, it doesn't just decide, OK, we're going to tick down interest rates. What it does is it goes to the federal government and it buys U.S. treasuries. Or in some instances, it might go to the banks and print new money and give it to the banks so the banks have more money now on deposit that they can then lend out. See, a bank can only lend out money if it has money in the bank. And for a long time now, they don't have a lot of savings in their bank. People don't save. You've got interest rates that are you know, really low and only going to go lower. And so they got to figure out, well, how do we get people to borrow money? How do we get them to consume? Because obviously it's consumption that drives the economy, right? It's a flawed Keynesian theory. And so what they're left doing is just giving banks money so that they have more money to lend out and then offering it to people who may be of less credit worthy nature than they would have liked, but who cares because the Fed's just creating the money. Okay? So it's not working. That system isn't working anymore. We've managed to blow that system up. We've incentivized consumption to the point that we bankrupted most Americans. Most of them cannot survive more than 30 days without a paycheck. That means they have no savings. Okay? So now the question is, what do we do? To be sure, with the recent launch of helicopter money, the Fed has tried to short-circuit this process. And in conjunction with the Treasury, it has launched helicopter money, which has resulted in the direct transfer of funds to U.S. corporations via the Triple P loans, as well as an end consumer via the emergency $600 a week unemployment benefit, which, however, are set to expire unless renewed by Congress, uh, which they did not do. So those are now gone. And yet the lament and, and yet the lament is that even as the economy was desperate in need of massive liquidity tsunami, the Fed crea uh, the Fed created by the Fed and the Treasury did not make their way to those who needed them the most, the end consumers. So now they're saying, they're actually saying this didn't happen fast enough. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago when I got out the blackboard and I drew on it and I said, here's what's going to happen. It doesn't matter who you give the money to. It always ends up back in the hands of the people who have the most money. Um, so if you give it to poor people, that's fine. They're going to spend it. And then it's going to move its way over to the wealthy people. And the wealthy people are now going to have more than they did before. And when you gave poor people money that you created out of thin air, all you do is increase wealth inequality. Does this make sense to everybody? Try Matt, am I doing a good job of explaining this? I think so. Yeah, okay. I'm following. Okay. So now we get the wealth inequality. And the argument now is that because, again, inflation is not ticking up, is that, well, we, we must not be getting it into the hands of the right people quick enough. We need a way to like radically and immediately give people money so that then they can go out and spend it when things turn south. How are they going to do that? Mm -mm. Let me see. Where does it go? The two proposed, the, there are two, uh, I'm like, I've got a for the Bloomberg Post, sorry, for thanks. Mm-hmm. The Fed Board of Governors, mm -mm, two guys who were on the plunge protection team for years at the Federal Reserve Bank, 
have put out a, uh, a, 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 a what they think is a solution to the problem. The two of them proposed creating a monetary tool that they called recession insurance bonds, which draw on some of the advantages of digital payments, uh, which will be wired instantly to Americans. As Coronado explains the details, Congress would grant the Federal Reserve an additional action tool. That means new powers. That's a really fancy, churchy way of saying we're going to let the Fed do something that we've never let them do before okay? uh, for providing support. Uh, the Federal Reserve additional tool for providing support, say a percentage of GDP in a lump sum that would be divided equally and distributed to households in a recession. Recession insurance bonds would be a zero coupon security, a contingent asset of households that would basically lie in wait. The trigger could be reaching the zero lower bound on interest rates, or as economist Claudia uh, Sahem has proposed, a 0.5 percentage point increase in the unemployment rate. The Fed would then activate the securities and deposit the funds digitally in households apps. Let me translate that for you. Okay. What they are suggesting is that the Fed would authorize the creation of what is called a zero coupon security. What that is, it, that's a fancy way of saying it's a bond that doesn't have an interest, an accruing interest rate, but rather has an interest rate that is due a, a maturity day, a maturity um, price that only is uh, that's only valuable at maturity. So normally if you buy a bond every year, it's going to yield a certain percentage. And then at the end of that, the time that you hold the bond, if it's a 10 year or a 30 year or whatever it is, then you get your principal back as well as the interest that you've been accumulating over the years. A, what the, a zero coupon security doesn't accrue interest over time. It just says, hey, in 10 years, this thing's going to be worth this, this much money. And it's not going to be worth, you can't, you know, there's nothing you can do with it until maturity other than sell it off. And so because of that, these particular securities trade at, at a deep discount, right? Because it's time value of money. If I have to wait 30 years to get my money, well, I, I, I'm not going to pay market a face value of the bond. If the bond's going to pay me, if I got to, you get what I'm saying? Like, I'm not going to pay face value for the bond. If I got to wait 30 years, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to pay a portion of what that thing's going to be worth in 30 years. And so by doing this, the Federal Reserve now has, you know, a percentage of GDP allocated in these bonds that don't have a, that, that don't accrue interest. Now, the value of that is that they can just keep rolling those bonds over and they never actually have to pay on any of them unless one of these things, one of these really dangerous things happen. And they said, well, it might be going below the zero bound in interest rates. If you've been a listener of this show for a long time, Below the zero bound means below 0% interest rates. We did not believe that that was possible until a few years ago. We thought, why would anybody, how would you ever have an interest rate below zero? Well, we now have something like, I don't know, like 14 countries that have interest rates below zero. And then the last thing is, well, what if, in, what if uh, uh, unemployment increases by a half a percent? Then we would inject money. So the theory here is, um, the, the monetary theory is really irrelevant. They're just going to create money whenever they need to give it to people. And then what they're going to do is everybody's going to have an app on their phone with some kind of digital currency on it. And when the time comes, when, un, uh, when unemployment ticks up or when interest rates go too low, then the Federal Reserve will literally just send money to people on their apps. And they're talking about it being evenly distributed or maybe it'll be weighted more towards those who are poorer. They don't know. But this is going to be a way that the Federal Reserve can respond by instantly putting money into people's pockets who are highly likely to go out and spend it. Okay. This can, I, can, I, can I try to see if I'm understanding everything? Yeah, go here? ahead. Okay, so basically the problem has been up till now that uh, the Fed has been printing money, attempting to get that money into circulation. The 
the the I'm speaking in really 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 rough broad broad terms. Yeah. Here. So let me. So they're, they're doing it to create inflation. That's the yeah, goal yeah. when they do that is lower interest rates, get, raise inflation. Not not necessarily to put money in the hands of people. They've been they've really been against that, Matt, for the for the last uh, for, for basically since they since they began. It's only that's their, recently that's the, that's that they've the been marketing trying. pitch. The yeah. Marketing pitches. We're trying to get this so that people don't freak out about it. Oh, we're just trying to get money into your hands, right? That's like that's. That's kind of that's why I was use, using that terminology. Um, so then, what has been actually happening is uh, we've been getting deflation because all of that money has been it hasn't been quote unquote trickling down to the average to the plebs. Uh, it's been basically banks and other. Um, it's like the, the the first line of people who are at the banks with their hands out to get the money. All the banks, all the major institutions, they've been accumulating all of that money. And then just like reinvesting it, buying their own stock. It's because there's there's like basically two tiers. There's the there's like the the people that are all immediately affiliated with the elites, and then there's all of the plebs who are just ordinary people. And that they it can't bridge that gap. That money hasn't been getting down to the ordinary people, which is what's required for inflation to 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 kick off. Right. So it's actually been having a deflationary effect. So what they're talking about is using um, a digital process to directly transfer that money to those people rather than trying to funnel it through banks and through other financial organizations. Correct. Right? And and to to circumvent the government who really likes to be in the business of handing out uh charity to people. So Yeah, like it, like trying to depoliticize the process. That's well that that's the theory is that we're going to yeah. depoliticize it and we can just send people money when we think it's important that they have money and they don't have to worry about that. Uh and and to you you got it exactly right. So really what's happened is is that the way the banks have traditionally done it is is the Federal Reserve has lowered interest rates by buying bonds, right? Well, we've seen what's happened on Wall Street as a result of that. Now you've got Apple who's borrowing billions of dollars and then just buying back its own stock. It has no reason to do this. It has plenty of cash on hand to buy back its own stock without borrowing money. But when you give the money to them at 1% interest, they don't care. They're going to, they'll buy back their own stock, immediately get a 5% lift in their, in their company stock value. And they're way ahead and they'll spend the next 30 years, 40 years paying that, you know, paying that loan off. They're not worried at all about that. The problem with that is, is that when they're buying back stock to lift their own share prices, they're not investing in research and development. They're, it's not making its way down to Joe Schmo, who's looking for a job um, and who needs money to spend on, on you know, essentials for his life. And so they've got to come up with a new way because the old system no longer is relevant because they've managed to get, uh, they've squeezed all the blood out of that turnip that they can get, right? Right. And so this is going to, this is really creating an even starker contrast between the haves and the have nots. Yes. All the people who are depending upon these, these direct digital payments, um, are it's, it's, it's widening the gap between them and, and the people because of the nature of the way that it, that it affects the human psychology. People are like, Oh, I'm going to get this direct digital payment. So I'm just going to wait around for that. There's no reason for me to, to try to go out and, and do anything else. So it's removing the incentive for, for innovation, for starting new businesses, for, for doing all of the things that are generally necessary to get you from, from the lower income quartiles to the higher, yes. the higher ones. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's really, it's creating, there, there's always has been this kind of like surf class. We've just kind of pretended that they aren't because for the, for this last several decades, it's been possible to work your way out of that surf class, but it's, this is, is really eliminating the middle class and creating a really starkly stratified uh, uh, economy with the the lower serfs who are just completely dependent, and then the people who are immediately affiliated with all the powerful um, institutions who are able to, um, who are given much more flexibility and the ability to to navigate and and change their own circumstances a lot easier. Yeah, you were, we we use the analogy around here about the ladder and and how you know it, it is be, it is still possible. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying those of you who are listening today. It is still very much possible for you to move into the, you know, the top 1% of of earners in 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 the in the country. Um it is uh, it, it may be easier now from a standpoint of technology to do it than ever before because we can make radical leaps rather than having to climb step by step. But one of the effects of this that is going to have dire consequences for those who are born at the very bottom, 
uh, at, in the future is the fact that we will see that middle class disappear because as they do more printing, every time they create money to send to the poor people, we get bigger wealth inequality. Okay? And you can then take money from the wealthy, which is what they will attempt to do at some point, because the, this, this system will, will collapse as well. Um, they'll attempt to go after 401ks. They'll attempt to go after you know, very wealthy people's investable assets. Uh, if they manage to accomplish that, it doesn't really matter. You can take what the rich have and give it back to the poor if you haven't equipped the poor to manage and grow that wealth, they just quickly send it back. If you look at any of the statistics, the vast majority of Americans live at their income level. So if their income goes up, their standard of living goes up. There's almost without fail, with rare exception, it is only that rarest of person who finds a way to increase their income, but either doesn't need to increase their lifestyle because they've done a good job already, or who is willing to delay gratification of that new wealth until later. Those are the only people who ever, uh, who ever do well with that type of wealth transfer. And that is, there's such a minute percentage of those people uh, as really not even to consider. Um, and so what you get is, is you get people who now, if you give them an extra thousand dollars a month in UBI, and let's say nothing else changes, and, and all that happens is you get now $10,000, $12,000 more a year than you had before. Instantly, for 99% of the people who receive that money, they will simply increase their lifestyle $12,000 a year. And they will see, they'll still be just as broke, they'll just have more stuff, or they'll have more liabilities that they have to pay for, uh, a bigger nut. And you won't ever be able to remove that $12,000 because it would be crushing, crippling to 90% of the population. This is, a, this is a, a very, very, very big concern with this stuff. You have to stop it, and, and they're not going to stop. And so that's really number one, maybe the biggest takeaway from this first section of the show today is they are not going to stop. So what does the future look like and what do you need to do to be preparing? And I'm going to tell you about our sponsors today and then, uh, and then we're going to dig right into that and I'm going to show you um, some of the... Uh, more pressing financial issues that our country is going to face and you as an individual and a family is going to face. But first, let me tell you about features. Boy, I do love me some feature socks. So features, and that's spelled F-E-E-T, like feet, F-E-E-T-U-R-E-S. You got to check these guys out. So they make a, a sock, an athletic sock that is, is probably, no, it is. It's the most comfortable athletic sock I have ever worn. It, it hugs your foot like, I don't know, like a, I don't know what you call it. It's almost like a compression sock, but it, you don't feel compressed. It just feels like it's part of your foot. And it's got vapor technology that helps keep your foot dry and blister free while providing a, a custom like fit that won't bunch up and slip uh, during your backswing or anything else you're doing. So whether you're going out and you're golfing, whether you're whether you're running, whatever you're doing to get your outdoor exercise right now, if you're going to the gym, you really need to try these socks out. You will not be disappointed in them. Trust me, uh, I wear them all the time. Every time I wear my, uh, every time I put my tennis shoes on and I go out to to walk or to to you know work. Workout, I'm always wearing these socks. They're that good. Feature socks will change how you how you feel about socks forever, and you can get ten dollars off your first pair of features when you use code Stapleton at features.com. That's f e e t u r e s dot com. Promo code Stapleton for ten dollars off your first pair of features. Love these guys. And the other one we got today is Helix Sleep. Another one of my favorite folks to read ads for. Love these guys. If you are having trouble and you need a new mattress and you know who you are, but for whatever reason, you've just decided, you know what, I've been putting it off. I want you to take their hundred night sleep trial. Um, I would I dare call it a challenge because I'm confident that if you go onto the website and you take their two minute sleep quiz and they match you with the perfect mattress for you and they deliver it to your door and you put it on your bed and throw out that garbage mattress that you've been sleeping on, that you will never go back. I don't know a single person who has bought one of these mattresses uh, off of my recommendation and has turned around and sent it back. What I do hear time and time again is, Jason, we got ourselves a Helix Sleep mattress. You were not lying. 
Okay. It was the best night of sleep we've ever had. It's the most comfortable bed we've ever laid on. Um, I have two of them. Matt has one of them. They are phenomenal. Okay. So this is what I want you to do right now. I want you to go to helixsleep.com slash Stapleton and take their two minute sleep quiz. Won't take you any time at all. And they will match you with a customized mattress for you. And right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash Stapleton. Go to helixsleep.com slash Stapleton for up to $200 off your mattress orders. Uh, right now, helixsleep.com forward slash Stapleton. All right. So why are we concerned about this? If Because uh, right now, a lot of people are not feeling the effects of any type of recession. They're at this point, people really are, are more frustrated with, I would, well, maybe that, maybe that's not entirely true. What I am seeing, at least with the people that I know is that everybody's doing pretty good. Uh, the, I, I know a lot of people in the, in the television and the movie business, and they have had a harder time than a lot of folks, uh, but even they are still employed. They're still working. Uh, the, the companies are still having to release movies. And so there's still stuff for everybody to do. If you're an actor or you work on this, on the set, actually in, in production, it's a little tougher for you because production has been shut down. But these guys are also used to going long stints between gigs, especially if you're if you're relatively new. And so they do a pretty good job of saving money and, and keeping it together so that they can. It's kind of feast or famine in that industry. And you just know that going into it. But for most people that I have come into contact with and from what I see in the in the broad economy is that nobody is radically changing their their finances. They might have trimmed back a little bit. They're saving a little bit more most of them are not spending in in many cases because they just can't. You can't go shopping at the stores anymore. You spend in a little bit more on Amazon, but really people have no concept of just how bad the economy is right now because the Fed and the Treasury have pumped 14 trillion dollars into this economy. 14 trillion of new money. That's a mind-boggling amount of money, okay? But let's talk a little bit about what the real problem is. The real damage, I'm reading now from, I'm reading from David Stockman, uh, Contra Corner blog, if you guys are interested in this. The real damage is far, far deeper uh, and is reflected in millions of small businesses permanently destroying tens of millions of households, wiping out financially uh, and Households being wiped out financially and the vicious chain, daisy chain of delinquencies, deferrals and defaults just beginning to rip through the 78 trillion edifice of debt, which entombs the U.S. economy. God, he does know how to turn a phrase, doesn't he? <laughs> OK, of course, most of Wall Street is uh, Wall Street's talking heads were uh, were nonplussed by this week's release because, well, QE results are claimed to be ancient history. So they're taking a look at the QE results when they come in. They're like, well, that was yesterday. We've, we're looking forward, which is think that things that Wall Street knuckleheads do all the time and talking heads on CNBC are constantly doing because their only goal is to talk about um, is to try and keep people invested, keep people confident, keep people in the market. If you shut off the TV and you stop listening, they stop getting ratings, they stop making money, they can't charge as much for their advertising. And here's one thing we know for sure. People check the financials, uh, their financial statements 10 times as much when times are good than when times are bad. When, when the stock market is going up, they actually did a study, TD Ameritrade did a study on how many times people would log in to check their balances in a given month. It goes up tenfold when the stock market is rising. So what, do you, what else do you think they do? What else is reasonable to assume when times are good? They're probably turning on the TV to hear about all the great financial news so they can go check their account balance and see how much money they're making. The inverse is true when things get bad. They don't look. They hide their head in the sand. They go out and, and they stop watching the financial news because it's just too bad. It's too ugly. Here's the, the truth. The QE results also leaves the recessionary, uh, leads to the recessionary drop. Oh, let me, let me start over from up here. This is where I want to start. Let's get something straight. Reading again from the article. 
What is happening is an economic catastrophe the likes of which we have never seen before, even during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Now, that is a bold, bold statement when you consider the unemployment, the mass poverty, the suffering that occurred during the Great Depression. Here's the truth. In fact, the worst annual decline back then was 14.8%, a drop that happened in 1932. While the entire peak to trough real GDP decline from 1929 to 1933 was 30.5%. So if you take the four-year recession, depression that happened from 1929 to 1933 during the Great Depression, the greatest peak to to trough uh, decline was 30.5%. But the deepest one-year decline was only 14.8%. So what you had was a very sustained decline in GDP as people were out of work and then more people out of work and then it got worse and worse. Let's look at today. So if we measure it on an annualized rate, the Dr. Fauci and his virus patrol have delivered a 32.9% GDP plunge, which single-handedly tops the entire correction of the Great Depression. I'll read that again. Last quarter's decline in GDP was greater than the entire decline of the Great Depression. What makes this one different, for the time being, is $14 trillion. That will have its own very negative impact moving forward. Uh, what was essentially, uh, what was especially notable, however, was the vaporization of personal consumption spending on services, which ordinary accounts for up to 70% of total PCE. PCE is a measure of personal consumption expenditure. That's what it stands for. Piece. It's how much are you spending on uh, really um, stuff for you personally, like eating out, shopping on clothes, that kind of stuff. That's that's PCE spending, um, and which is also a which is also ballyhooed by the paint by numbers Wall Street economists and uh, that uh, the guys who keep talking about GDP numbers moving higher. Okay, not this time. Services spending literally fell through a trap floor. Uh, trap door, excuse me, contracting 43.4% at an annualized rate last quarter. Okay. This is the key. I want you to listen to this. Last quarter, personal consumption expenditures were reduced by 43.4%. In the last 11 recessions, going back to 1950, Real spending on personal services never went negative, save one time. And that was a 1.6% annualized decline in the first quarter of 2009. That was the bottom of the last recession that we saw. 43.4% decline last quarter. So to understand this correctly, is is he saying that in all 11 recessions, except for the first quarter of 2009, spending on services has never gone negative. On an annualized basis, this, yes. On I, an I, annualized I, basis. Yeah. And then in this case, it went negative to the tune of 43.4%. Correct. That's exactly what he's saying. That means that means we, we lost half of it. We've never lost half. We've never lost more than like a one, one and a half percent decline. In the and last never really years. lost anything. Typically, no. we've never lost anything. No, most of the time, we never see any personal expenditure reductions. That that should give you some idea of how incredibly bad this is. There's there's something of, like we've been learning a lot about that, like how resilient this system is. Because if you if you took these numbers and and offered them to somebody in 2000 or even in 2009, 2010. They would be like the entire country would have to be on fire, like the, the like the sky would be falling. Yeah. And yet somehow this has happened, and it's like the the bad stuff is coming. It's just around the corner. It's coming. Here it comes. There's all these signals that it's coming. It's coming, and it just never comes. It, it, it's there's something that I, I I guess it I guess it comes down to like what did what did Keynes call it like the the animal spirits or whatever that that the like the X factor here is the psychology, the collective psychology of the country. Yes. And somehow 
to this point, the collective psyche, like, like if, if everybody believed that there was nothing wrong, then there would never be anything wrong. Like if you could somehow, if you could somehow like, uh, like tap into the brain of every single person and just flip a little switch, making it so they never thought that there was anything wrong and the economy was always healthy. It wouldn't matter what happened in the economy. Yes. It would always be healthy. Well, and that's somehow this has been happening. That's not technically true. So, but you, you make some good points there. So, uh, first thing I'll say is that that Keynes was not an idiot. Not, there are not enough Austrians and and other uh, people who have other um, economic beliefs. Most of them are uneducated rubes who read one book on economics from an Austrian, and now they think they understand economics. Okay, uh, Keynes was a brilliant economist. He he was he was alive at a time when nobody really understood economics. It was it was a new theory that was being proposed. And, and Keynes was a brilliant human being. Um, he was very prone to changing his beliefs uh, because as as he understood more about what was going on, he changed the way he thought about things. Um, and one of the things that he talks about uh, in in uh, his book uh, is he talks about the animal animal spirits? I think that's it's the animal spirits is not right, but I'm that you're close. And basically, what he's saying is is that there's a factor for human decision making and human emotions uh, that you must take into account when making these decisions, these financial decisions. We understand it now more uh, along the lines of behavioral economics, and and people make different choices based on where they are now and what they believe things will look like later. And, and so there 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 isn't really a math formula that works. There's no completely right answer of what to do right now. Um, one, but one of the things, so a great example of this is I've been talking for a long time and just telling everybody, look, these financial numbers are terrible. You can't have people who don't have any savings who spend every penny that they make. That is a completely illogical thing to do. If you have extra money, which most Americans could save something if they wanted to, they just don't. That is an illogical, irrational decision to make. Unless you feel relatively confident that what happened yesterday is going to happen tomorrow and you're still going to get your paycheck and the, you know, the economy is good. And so, you know, you feel like you can take on a little bit of debt or you can spend up until you've you know spent all of your money because you'll be able to make some more later. That's a completely, that is while, while irrational is, is, is understandable given the inputs that you have. And so one of the things that I have been working on for the last two years is trying to help you understand just at, at a, what a pain point we're at right now. And so whether I got you to get a raise and that you saved a little bit of money or you started your side business. And so now you're, you're in a place where you're going to start generating income from that. And you're kind of taking control of your financial destiny and, and the source of your income, whatever action you have taken up until this point has helped set you apart from the vast majority of people who live in a world that really has has no basis in reality uh, and and they make decisions based on emotion rather than looking at what is truly happening and so I bring this up to you today uh, to point out that yes we have an incredibly resilient economy um, and, and and people will keep spending in the face of this and one of the reasons that dollar People keep talking about hyperinflation and the dollar bears come out and they, oh, today's the day. It's a coming around the corner. It's happening now. And then it never happens, right? The, the, part of that is just simply because the Fed's response is always another little heroin injection. I, I use these, the, all of this money that the Fed pumps into the economy and that the central uh, and that our, uh, our treasury continues to pump in, all of this money gives you a feeling that it's okay. Even today with the $600 that you're getting and you know, also you're saving a little bit of money, but many people are actually making more money sitting around doing nothing than they did at their jobs. Okay. So even then they can't really feel the effects. It's as though you see a heroin addict on day one when they're, they're arrested the first time. And then when they're arrested, like, you know, the last time and you see just how unhealthy they are. But man, the second that they get that next hit, all of that goes away. They don't care anymore. They feel euphoric. They feel like on top of the world, like everything's going to be great. And all they want when they wake up and realize what an utter shambles their life is in and how, how, how rock bottom they're really at is they just want another hit. They just want one more to get back to that feeling of euphoria. 
And eventually, if they do it long enough, it will kill them. And that's where our economy is right now. We are, it is in such bad shape, not just in the U.S., but globally. And the question is, how long can the Fed and other central banks continue to do this before like, it really starts to come apart at the seams? And as I said from the beginning, I don't know the answer to that question. I can show you what the next step is. So the stuff they've been doing now for the last 20 years is not working anymore. We're not seeing inflation. We're not seeing consumption driving, uh, consumption increasing. Uh, and, and we are highly susceptible to m massive economic loss from something like a, a Fauci who is out there claiming that, you know, we have a pandemic on our hands when 1% of our population has been infected. Okay. This is dangerous times we live in. And so if the system is broken and we're not getting the same result, they're going to have to now adjust. And the adjustment will be two things. It will be direct capital liquidity injections, direct money creation into the hands of those who are the most likely to spend it. And the second thing will be to reduce interest rates below zero to, again, incentivize people not to save. Now, what do we need to have happen? Really, in reality, what on a broad scale, what needs to happen? What needs to happen is people need to stop spending and they need to start saving. And they need to build up a store of resources that they can then deploy when opportunity presents itself. That is a, almost an impossibility at this point. The only people in the, in the future economy who are going to be able to do that are the ones who are the net producers. If you, are, if you find yourself a consumer today, primarily a consumer, um, you're going to be in a world of hurt in the economy of tomorrow because you will never find yourself in a position where you will be able to save. You will find yourself getting liquidity injections from the Federal Reserve every time there's a recession. You will spend everything that you make right up until the point. And part of what the Fed is doing now is providing a safety net for you to do that. See, if, I, if every time things go bad and unemployment ticks up or interest rates have to go down in order to stimulate the economy, I get a check, what's the risk of me spending every penny I make? Eh, ah, the government will just give me more when the time comes. I'm not ever going to be like out of work or, or I'm not ever going to be out of my house. I'm not ever going to have that kind of problem. Or they're they're de-incentivizing you from doing the very thing that you need to be doing now more than ever. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that like, what we would need is we would need everybody to start saving. But if everybody isn't going to start saving, then there even isn't a lot of there isn't a lot of financial incentive for you to save either because the the value of that money is just degrading. So if you're just saving, if you're just sitting on it, then you're you know, you're ultimately like you're you're relying on something that's not going to be there for you in the long run. It's like you almost you need to be spending but not spending on consumable stuff that everyone else is spending on. You need to be investing. And one of the best ways to invest is to to take your wealth and instead of having it be in dollars or even in some other type of asset, the best asset that you can invest your wealth in is your own capacity, your own knowledge and skill set and um, and uh, relationships, networks. If you can invest all of that money in these like intangible things that will go with you no matter what happens to the economy. Yeah, so and if you. I was going to say, you know, oh, like go, ahead, go ahead. Spending, but spending on things that are going to generate a return for you in the long run. So spending on a boat isn't going to return you anything in the long run. I mean, unless that boat is what enables you to get connections to wealthy people that are, you know, that's kind of what I'm thinking here. Like yeah. you need to be investing in, in stuff that makes, that improves your ability to support yourself and make you valuable to other people in the long run and in relationships that will get you through uh, when times get rough. Yeah, so that's the second half of what I of what I want to say. So you you're yeah, you just you were just a little bit ahead of me. So the the question that there is there are all kinds of very negative consequences if everybody decides to save at the same time. GD like people don't spend on stuff, GDP falls, we get unemployment, we get this spiraling deflationary effect that is it has its own really negative consequences, okay? But we're not at any threat of that happening. 
I mean, there, there's no threat that suddenly <laughs> Americans are going to find themselves in the spirit of saving, right? They're, they're going to be de-incentivized to do that from e every point. And most of them lack uh, the both the the knowledge necessary to see what's going on and make different choices. And also they, they lack the, uh, the, the, the discipline to do it, okay? Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't start saving and investing, okay? What, and, and what Matt's saying is correct. So when I spend, well, I, I spend on things I enjoy too. It's not, I mean, I, I got a little bit of money though. So here's what I'm saying. If you find yourself in a position where you want to start saving and reallocating your, reallocating your money to something that's actually going to protect you as we grow and as this economy be, continues to change and evolve, there are two primary things that you can do that will help you do that. So, so the first one is always in your own human capital. If you don't know how to do th the, the more things you know how to do and the higher in demand those things are, um, the more money you will make and the more insulated you will be during times of recession. Okay, so learning skills, constantly learning new skills. Uh, people always ask me, well, what skills should I learn? I don't really know. And you know, we talked about this on Friday. Uh, if you want to know, this is what I tell you to do. Learn how to sell. Very first thing, learn how to sell. Communication is selling is communication. That's what it is. Learn to be a better communicator and learn how you use that communication to sell something. Okay. Once you do that, you're going to be in good shape. You, you will be one of the last people who will ever be out of work because I don't care what kind of economy you're, I don't care if we have 30% unemployment or 40% unemployment. If unemployment is 40%, that means that 60% of the population is still getting up and going to work every day. And that means the people who own companies, the people who are producers, they're going to need somebody to move product for them. And if you know how to do that and you can prove that you can do that, you can almost write your own ticket. So that's the number one thing. Once you've learned that and you feel like you've got a good handle on the selling part, you learn how to market. Because I don't care what business you end up in, you are in the marketing and the selling business. That's all you do. That's the primary goal of your company is to find as many people as possible who would want your product, who would get value from it, and then to sell it to them. Okay? So you learn those two things. So human capital, marketing and selling if you don't know what else to do. Okay? And then the second thing that you can do is you can move yourself onto the producer side of the ledger and out of the consumer side. That means taking those skills and working for yourself rather than for someone else. If you can accomplish those two things, you will find yourself on the right side of the equation. Okay, the, the bulk of the, we are seeing a shift. There is a destruction happening in the middle class right now, but more people are moving up than moving down. This will continue to happen. The only way to avoid it is to be more valuable than anybody else and to eventually start doing it for yourself rather than for somebody else. We have, oh, you have all of the tools. You can now reach a global market. You can, you can do all of the marketing and the promotion that you want for free. Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube will literally let you market yourself, your services, everything you do, create brand, uh, create television shows and many, you, you want to be on TV. It's as easy as just starting your own show. That, it's that easy. A lot of steps involved with starting your own show. A lot of skills you got to learn before you can do that. But there are, there are no gatekeepers for you selling product. There, there's no hurdle, financial hurdle to overcome to reach your audience. But you've got to get started learning these skills. If you don't, you're going to be stuck from, you know, taking the scraps from somebody's table who did learn these skills. And so I'm, I implore you, as I have for two years now, okay, if you still have money, if you still have a job, if you don't have a job and you are wondering what you're going to do with your life, step one is to get out there and learn some skills that are going to make you valuable. And then finally, when you are ready, as soon as humanly possible, start working your own thing. And if you want, Skillshare is not even an advertiser today. They're going to get a free read from me. Skillshare.com forward slash Stapleton. They will give you two free months of full access to every single one of their programs for two months. 
if you are talking to me and you are listening to this show and you are, you are the type of person that I just mentioned who needs new skills, who needs to start controlling the source of their income and your big excuse is that you ain't got no money. Well, if you're broke and you're sitting at home and you ain't got no job and you ain't got no money, guess what you do have a, a, a bunch of time. You should be camped out 12, 14 hours a day on your laptop, burning the midnight oil, learning as many skills as you can and finding ways to practically apply them right now. Okay. And I know that you guys are out there. I know you're listening. Okay. Another thing you can do is go to controlthesource.com. I've been in the information business for a number of years. It's the greatest business and it's only getting better. And if you have knowledge and skills that the world would find valuable, then one of the easiest and cheapest businesses that you can start is an information business. And I will teach you how to do it. I will teach you in 30 days, we will put a business together for you. If you do the work in 30 days, you can have a business up and running. But you got to do the work. You got to stop sitting around and putting your head in the sand refusing to accept the reality of the situation that we live in. You must be proactive. Those are the people that survive. Those are the people who thrive. Are the people who are proactive. That's why some restaurants fail and some stayed open. Some people started thinking outside the box really early on. I have hundreds of people in my Freedom Accelerator program, many of whom started their transition years ago. Vincent is a great example of that. Started a jewelry business many years ago, refocused his efforts. Now he's working even harder. Part-time business is starting to see results. See, he caught on years ago. Some of you are catching this show for the first time today. And if that's the case, then today's the day your life has to start to change. Either that or you got to be very comfortable with being broke and dependent. Because that is where you will end up. It is a financial certainty. Don't let it be you. All it takes is commitment and time. Guys, I'm so glad that you are here today. I'm so glad that you listened to the show. Matt, do we have any, uh, any super chats or anything we got to go through? Um, nope. There was one super chat from Simo. He just asked, uh, at the beginning of the show where he can learn about trading from you or other people in the space. I just told him about your trading mastery program. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing I would say is we've got the, you mentioned Vincent, we've got the winner's list, the telegram, telegram channel. And one of the things that they do in there, and they've taken it over to the nine figure network as well. They do the same thing there. I've seen, uh, they, they do, uh, wins on Friday. They, they come together and they talk about the different wins that they've had throughout yeah. that week. And it's just super inspiring. Um, so if you wanted to join the Telegram channel as well, that's jasonstapleton.com forward slash winners. And there's a really good group of people in there that are always comparing notes and, and, and keeping each other encouraged. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so we got lots of resources for you if you want them. If not, if not me, then someone. Then go do something. And we'll see you back here on Wednesday to do this all over again. Until then, be safe, be good. I'll talk to you then. If you enjoyed today's show, do me a favor. Subscribe and then share it with a friend. And if you're ready to take the next step towards controlling your life, income, and future, then I'd like to help. Just go to controlthesource.com to get started.